Um, I apologize to the experts uh, because in this lecture, actually, I'm going to introduce again something that maybe you already uh, know, but I see a lot of young people in the audience. So I'm not assuming that you know the theory of currents. I would start from scratch. OK, so what we are going uh, um, to do, so the basic goal is to give you some ideas about uh, a famous regularity result for minima surfaces, which is due to Algren and which I have revisited recently with um, a PhD former PhD student of mine, Emanuele Espadaro. So it's, it's a very complicated proof, as several people know. So I will not be able to give you uh, uh, many details. But I will try you to, to give you a complete account of the proof of its difficulties. And then I will try to actually give you the details of what is probably the most complicated part in a toy situation, in a situation which is simplified. OK. So let me start with um, uh, something that probably you all know, the uh, so-called Plateau's problem. OK, so it's a very famous problem in mathematics, in the calculus of variations. And um, uh, it's essentially the following problem. So you have a contour which is m minus 1 dimensional. in the Euclidean space. And you look for uh, surfaces sigma of dimension n, or more general sets or objects of dimension n, which span this contour. So if sigma and gamma were actually smooth surfaces, you would then write it in the following way and minimize the n-dimensional volume. OK, so of course, two basic questions that you would ask about such a problem as a mathematician are existence and regularity. They're by no means the most important or, or, or the only important questions. I mean, there are several other uh, things which are important. So how they look like, whether you can compute interesting quantities, and so on. But of course, any interesting mathematical theory mo sooner or later will use uh, these two facts. I mean, the fact that if you have a contour, you, there is actually a minimizer, which uh, has all sorts of consequences, for instance, replacement theorems. I mean, if you have a surface which is doing something and you want to cut out a piece, you might think of replacing it with the minimizer of the area. And of course, the regularity, because if you're interested in uh, uh, more qualitative uh, properties, one thing that you would like to do is to compute, uh, for instance, differential geometric invariance and things like that. OK, so mostly we will actually bother about regularity. But let me, of course, also telling, tell you something about existence. So and then we come later to regularity. OK, so. The question of existence is, per se, at, at, the, at, the, at the very beginning, uh, um, uh, already a very hard question. So what is actually the, corre the, the correct notion of surface that I have to take to, uh, to, uh, to give existence? So should I only allow surfaces which are smooth? Should I only allow surfaces which are embedded? Should I actually allow, I don't know, polyhedra or more general surfaces? So there are, in fact, several answers in the literature. And the several answers in the literature, they are uh, all of them quite beautiful, and they serve different purposes. So depending on the questions that you are interested in, uh, that's at least my, my, my view about the topic. So I'm going, to, I'm going to enter into one particular way of formulating the existence. And it will be for the oriented plateau, plateau problem. So, And this will use the theory of currents. So it's very important that it's the oriented plateau problem. In particular, we will use the so-called integral currents. OK, so therefore, the starting point is what is, uh, uh, first of all, a current. So one first observation that you have, which is very elementary, if sigma is a smooth surface, Well, oriented surface, 
then you can integrate over the surface a form. And this gives you naturally an action on the space of forms. OK, so now for me, here omega is a uh, uh, compactly supported form of dimension m. OK, I never remember if this guy goes up, down. OK, so this is a bit random. Maybe it goes down. I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe one thing that I should say is this uh, uh, first lecture I'm taking from a survey well, where the numbers should be correctly placed up or down because I look it up on the web. Uh, and the survey is not yet available on my web page, but it's going to be available very soon. I mean, I think at the end of the week. OK, so this gives you, of course, a linear functional. And then, therefore, motivates the following definition. For us, a current is just a linear functional on the space of smooth, compactly supported forms, which enjoys the usual continuity property. Huh? So a current for which we will usually use the uh, notation t, the letter t, is a continuous, continuous linear functional on the space of smooth, compactly supported forms. Of course, depending on the dimension of the form, you will have a dimension for the current. So let me add here an m-dimensional current. OK. So I'm not going to tell you exactly what is the formal definition of continuity. You can imagine that. So of course, as a particular case, you get distributions, right? So a zero-dimensional current is just a continuous linear functional on the space of compactly supported uh, functions. Okay. Very good. So once we have actually uh, 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 such an object, we can think about this current as a generalization of the concept of a classical surface. And now we would like to introduce a concept of boundary and a concept of volume, and then formulate the corresponding Plateau's problem in that situation. Okay? And this is rather easy. In fact, I should say that I mean the, the, the first one to introduce uh, uh, currents were, uh, was Deram in the 50s. Although his, primer in, his primary interest was not the Plateau's problem, rather uh, building a, 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 uh, an homology theory. But we will come back to that later. OK, so of course, a boundary is, is very easy to define. We do it uh, by enforcing Stokes theorem. So the boundary of a current T, I have to specify what it is by its action on a form omega. And of course, I will just say that this is equal to the action of T on the d of omega, OK? So and the consistency with the usual surfaces is given by Stokes' theorem. But otherwise, for us, this is a, a definition. OK, so this, is, this gives you the concept of boundary. The concept of mass is a bit more complicated. OK, so for the concept of mass, you can actually do the following. So first of all, you introduce the co-mass. Or maybe first you introduce the length of a simple k vector. OK, so this is just denoted in the following way. And this is just the volume of, so the k-dimensional volume of this um, in Italian, it's parallelepipedo. I don't know what's in English, parallelepiped, maybe. Uh, OK, so this would be like uh, lambda e v i, as well, lambda, lambda i v i, sum for i equal 1 to k, uh, where the lambda i's are all uh, numbers between 0 and 1. OK, it's the usual thing. So if you had two vectors, you would just have the parallelogram. OK, then this actually induces a slightly complicated uh, uh, route to the, to, to, the, to the notion of mass in this, con in this context. So first of all, if you have a form you introduce what is called the comas. And the comas is defined by duality with these objects. So it's let us denote it in the following way. 
So this is the supremum. Actually, in this case, I think it's a maximum because this is a smooth form, but nonetheless. So you take omega at a point p, and you couple it with, your, what you, with, with, with any m vector, which is simple. So this is the duality pair between vectors and covectors. And you do this over all simple k vectors which have length less or equal than 1. OK, and once you actually have this uh, um, quantity over here, you can define uh, the mass of a current T. as the supremum of t of omega over all omegas which have commas less or equal than 1. OK, now it's a relatively simple exercise to actually show that if you have a classical surface, uh, that quantity over there gives you the area of a classical surface. OK, so this is, I leave it to you over here. It's a simple exercise using the, uh, the area formula. So first of all, let me introduce you to a very uh, 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 common notation in geometric measure theory. So we have an object which is an oriented surface, sigma. But then we have another object which is the current induced by it. Okay? So usually, to distinguish between the two objects, we actually call the um, current in this way. So we put these two uh, uh, brackets between sigma. OK, so that's the current. So then the exercise is if sigma is an oriented submanifold, then the volume, the uh, m-dimensional volume of sigma is exactly the mass of the current induced by sigma. And the reason is the following. Write down what the area formula is telling you. When you have an explicit parameterization, the area formula is giving you the integral over the chart of the length of a certain m vector. And the m vector is just the differential of the map, which is giving you the chart, applied to the standard m vector in the Euclidean scale, in the Euclidean case. Okay? The action of the form is the integral of this m vector against omega. Okay? And the maximization that you have on that omega that you have defined in this way picks up on that simple m vector exactly the length of the m vector. Okay? So that's the reason why we went in duality in this way. Okay. Before we go on, just one warning. So you see that so th this notation will appear very often. Okay? So we have a surface sigma, and then we, we make the two brackets, and we consider the uh, uh, corresponding currents. We are going to do this even in a silly situation. So a zero-dimensional current uh, is, of course, a, a distribution, as we said. A zero-dimensional submanifold is a collection of points for me. So if I have a single point, I can associate to this point a, a current, which would be the Dirac mass at that point. But rather than using the notation delta p for the Dirac mass of that point that everybody would do, I will in instead use this notation over here. Which is, by the way, consistent with, um, with, with, with the previous theory. OK? Very good. So now, uh, it's a very simple exercise in functional analysis once you have these tools to show that in this context, the Plateau's problem is, uh, is um, a nice variational problem, meaning that in the space of currents with finite mass, oh, by the way, maybe I should say this. Stop. No, it doesn't. The red. Ah, stop. OK, so of course, T for me has finite or locally finite mass. If mass of t is less than infinity, and this locally finite will mean that if instead of testing with any form, I test with forms which are compactly supported in a, uh, uh, in a ball, for instance, then I will have something finite. Okay? So this will be just because sometimes we will want to actually consider surfaces which are infinite 
uh, which have infinite mass just because they're going up to infinity, but they're actually pretty nice surfaces. OK, so if, if of course, if I'm not consistent with, uh, with, with something, then you just tell me. But sometimes I will be a bit sloppy. OK, so now this is, again, an exercise because it's basic functional analysis. So uh, now, any time, so for any, OK, so fix any, uh, say, t, uh, uh, m minus 1 dimensional current in Rm plus n, and assume the existence of a current of finite mass that spans it. OK, then there exists a minimizer. Well, at this point, this is a minimum. Right, I want S, and I want S0. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. And of course, I want S0 to have the correct boundary. OK, and in fact, you can do it this. I mean, you can do this even by constraining your current to live in a certain particular subset. OK? So I can define the support of a current in the usual way. So the support of a current T is just the complement of the maximal open set such that if forms are, uh, are supported in, the, in this open set, then I don't get anything. So complement of maximal U open such that T of omega is equal to 0 for every omega which is supported in U. And what I can do is I can actually define a plateau problem for surfaces which are, I mean, for currents whose support is constrained in a closed set. Okay? Okay, why is that interesting? Because by Nash embedding theorem, I can take any Riemannian manifold, any portion of a Riemannian manifold at least, any compact Riemannian manifold, and put it in the Euclidean space. And in that way, what I can do is I can define minimizers of the area in a Riemannian manifold by this trick. It's ugly from the geometric point of view. But for a lot of technical things, it's actually very effective. Because it's nice to have an object which is in the Euclidean space rather than in the, in the, in the, in the surface. And it's better than to go and then discuss vectors and covectors in a tangent bundle and so on, which, is, which adds some complications. OK, so this is just to say that it's uh, possible to solve the plateau problem in this way in Riemannian manifolds. And this is important for a lot of geometric applications, especially if you're looking at the plateau problem in higher co-dimension, uh, where a lot of the motivation comes from problems from differential geometry. OK, so this is all nice. So this is an exercise because, by the way, we have defined the mass it's automatically lower semi-continuous, and because the compactness is Banakalaoglu, uh, whatever. Uh, but it's not nice from another point of view. So uh, you can make a very simple example. So if I have a sphere, and I am now minimizing the length in, uh, uh, in the sphere, so I can actually formulate this in terms of currents. So for instance, I can take the south pole and the north pole, and I can look at the current, which is the difference between the Dirac mass at the North Pole and at the South Pole. Now my constraint over here would be the sphere. So there is a minimizer of the mass among all one-dimensional currents which have n minus s as a boundary and which sits in the, in the sphere. But of course, you will recognize that what I can do in my formulation is take two meridians and put Multiplicity lambda over here and multiplicity 1 minus lambda over there. And this would be a minimizer of the, a minimizer of the mass. A single meridian is a minimizer of the mass.
But if I take two half meridians, I also have a minimizer of the mass. And the reason for this is that if I, just, if I tell you that a current is just uh, a linear functional on the space of forms, of course, nobody forbids me to take a nice surface and put on the surface a weight which is a transcendental number, for instance. Nobody is forbidding me to do that. And the theorem over here will never tell you which kind of minimizer you've picked up at this level of generality. Of course, you might say, OK, so here the situation is triggered by the non-uniqueness of the geodesic, right? So you can imagine this is always the case when you have non-uniqueness. If you have two classical minima surfaces, area minimizing surfaces, which I'm spanning a given contour, they have the, less, the same area. And from the point of view of currents, I can pick half of it and half of the other. It's a bad minimizer, but it's a situation in which there is always a good minimizer. But the problem is more dramatic, because there's a classical theorem by L.C. Young, which tells you that if you formulate the Plateau's problem in this way, the minimizer might be strictly smaller than when you formulate the Plateau problem by only allowing integer multiplicities. Okay? So that's a Lavrentiev gap phenomenon, which I'm going to state very precisely uh, after I've introduced uh, more language. Okay, so Lavrentiev gap phenomenon between real and integer multiplicities. So that's one fact, which is unsatisfactory. The other point is the following. So actually, Deram started this theory because he was interested in homology theory. And one of the things that you can show is that if you have a classical Riemannian manifold and you try to build an homology theory by using currents, I mean, currents is a, a differential chain because if you apply twice the boundary operator, you get 0. You can then recover the usual homology theories, but of course with real coefficients, not with integer coefficients, because you're allowing to multi multiplication by, 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 by any number. Okay? So it's also from the point of view of geometry interesting to uh, 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 restrict yourself to integer multiplicities. Uh, but of course, if you want to do something like that, then you have to introduce more structure. And uh, the game becomes much harder. OK, so that's. I've done that, I've done that. OK, so maybe just one last notational thing, which I'm going to write over here. Uh, so um, no, I'm going to write it later. No, let me go on. OK, so let, let me come, therefore, to the Federer-Fleming theory. So now I want actually to allow only integer multiplicities. Or if you want, I want to uh, uh, allow only integer, I mean, only integer, I mean, only pieces of, say, reasonable submanifolds counted with uh, different multiplicities. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a special class of currents, which are called integer rectifiable currents. OK, so there's a slightly, uh, there's a small technical difference between this definition and the usual one, which I'm going to tell you in a second. OK, so a current T is integer rectifiable if there exists uh, uh, three uh, uh, family of objects. So first of all, a countable family of C1 submanifolds. Then a countable subfamily of compact subsets. And then a countable family of, uh, OK, oriented submanifolds. Huh? And then a, a, a set of coefficients, lambda i, which we can assume to be positive. 
and nature at all with the following property. So we want two formulas to be correct. So the first formula, we want somehow that t of omega, so the action of the current on the form, uh, uh, is the summation of lambda i times the integral over ki of omega. Okay, so on each of the compact subsets, I can integrate the form omega, which is well defined because I have a C1 submanifold. And then I want actually that the action of the current is the sum, I mean, is the series of this guy. Of course, to make this definition work, I would need that the series is summable. And I use this trick. Let me impose from the start that the sum of the k dimensional of the m dimensional volumes of the ki is finite. OK, then this series actually, oh, times lambda i. OK, then this series, of course, would be uh, uh, um, uh, absolutely summable. OK, and it's, it's, it's well defined. Now, this is slightly awkward because I'm requiring that uh, the current has finite mass by this. It's actually not difficult to see that if I, you see it immediately, if I make this requirement, the mass of the current t will be bounded by this series, and therefore it will be finite. This is slightly awkward for some applications, so you actually have to modify the definition in such a way that this is true on every compact subset. Okay? And then what you will have is that an integral rectifiable current has locally finite mass, but that's actually what the usual definition does. Okay, so let me just put over here plus a localization procedure. So the localization procedure would be tedious, but it just says that any time that omega is supported, for instance, on a ball, I want actually that uh, the sum of lambda i and then the volume of the compact sets intersected with the ball is finite. OK? That's what I want. Very good. So now, of course, this looks much more reasonable because I'm telling you, you cannot pick up half of a surface, right? So these coefficients have to be integers. But then you have lost the other powerful thing which we had before, that is, this guy is not anymore a vector space because I cannot multiply by a real coefficient. So of course, you cannot have um, uh, both uh, things at the same time. So in Italy, we say you cannot have uh, the wife drunk and the barrel full of wine. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what we say. And so now, of course, the existence of a minimizer for the plateau problem becomes a very hard, a, a very hard uh, theorem. And, and this is uh, uh, one of the main achievements of this classical paper by Federer and Fleming in the 60s. So this class of currents is compact. OK, so the theorem says in particular that if tk is a sequence of integer rectifiable currents and the mass of tk is bounded a priori by a constant and the mass of the boundary of tk is bounded a priori by a constant, then a subsequence, not relabeled, converges to an integer rectifiable current. OK, so the mass, the semi-continuity of the mass is always the same uh, business. I mean, it's defined in duality, so it's obviously semi-continuous. So this is all you need to actually prove the existence of a minimizer. OK, so you fix a boundary, you fix a minimizing sequence, Take a boundary which has finite mass, and then you have the, the mass of the boundary which is automatically bounded. 
And then, of course, if there is at least one current which has finite mass, which is always the case in the Euclidean space, we will see it in a second, then there is a minimizing sequence with a uniform bound, of course, on the mass of the, of the guys. So then you have both controls, and then you extract a subsequence, which is converging to something. The something has the same boundary because the boundary is fixed. And by semi-continuity, that, that has to have less mass than the limit of the masses. But then if it is also integratifiable, then it's in your class. So it has to be actually a minimizer. Good. So of course, here, um, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm formulating everything in the Euclidean space. But you can formulate a version of this theorem in which the currents are actually living not in the Euclidean space, but in an open subset. And the boundary would be uh, relatively to the open subset. That is, when I define the boundary, I only allow to test with forms which are compactly supported. That is just to say that this theorem can be localized. You don't really need to have a control of the mass and the boundary over the whole space. But if you're interested in passing into the limit in an open subset for these objects, you can still do it. OK? Good. So this, of course, does not exhaust the fundamental paper by Federer and Fleming, because uh, there are at least two other major theorems in there. So one of them is the boundary rectifiability theorem. So the boundary rectifiability theorem says that if T is integer rectifiable. And the mass of the boundary is finite, then actually the boundary is integer rectifiable as well. Right, which is a great conclusion. So it tells you a regularity of the boundary, essentially. OK, and then there is another theorem, which I'm not going to state, because it requires quite a lot of terminology. It's called the deformation lemma. So the deformation lemma essentially tells you that if you have an, integral rectifiable cur an integral current, you can approximate it with a sequence of polyhedral chains in an effective way. Polyhedral chains are just uh, 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 sums, some infinite sums, of integer multiplicities times uh, uh, normal surfaces, I mean normal actually flat surfaces. OK, so this approximation theorem, in a sense, tells you that the Lavrentiev gap phenomenon that we said before does not exist in this situation, because you can always approximate things with nice objects. Uh, I'm just going to mention one uh, important corollary of this, which is the isoperimetric inequality. So this is a corollary of the deformation theorem. So the isoperimetric inequality tells you. So for any S integer rectifiable with the following two properties. So the boundary of S is equal to 0. And the mass of S is finite, although maybe this I could drop. Uh, there exists a T integer rectifiable with the boundary of T equal to S. And with the mass of T which is bounded by a universal constant, which in the Federer and Fleming theorem depends on both dimension and co-dimension. But in a later proof by Angren, is actually depending only on the dimension. And now I have to decide the dimension of these guys. OK, so um, m minus 1 is the dimension of the boundary. OK, now here there is a big caveat when I told you that you can approximate currents nicely with polyhedral chains. OK? So just a, it's just a warning. So with the theory of integral currents, you can actually do homology theory. So in a Riemannian manifold, you take an integral homology class. There's always a representative which has least area among the currents, OK? Because the, the, the homology theories are equivalent, so you can actually represent the cycles with integral currents. Now, it's, I don't know how it is proved, but it's a fact 
There are homology classes. When I read it, I think it's a seven-dimensional homology class in a 14-dimensional manifold, which do not have a smooth representative. That means this minimization property cannot give you something smooth, but it also means that there is no current which is smooth, which is representing that class. So the polyhedral chains are allowing a certain kind of singularities. And in the Euclidean space, you might hope to do without it, although I wouldn't know how to prove it. But of course, if you are in the Riemannian manifold, the algebraic topology is telling you that some singularity is needed. Okay? So it's a reasonable approximation. But if you were thinking of approximating things which is something really smooth, then it might be a problem, unless you are in a special situation like co-dimension 1, for instance, in which there are special techniques to smooth objects. OK. Um, there must be something that I wanted to say, which I forgot, because, ah, right. So L.C. Young's theorem, because it's very interesting. OK, so this is a theorem by L.C. Young. Uh, there are modern proofs. I think the, I mean, there is one modern proof by, by uh, uh, Frank Morgan. I think the most effective proof is actually by Brian White because it's just four pages. So this theorem says, says the following. So there exists a gamma uh, closed embedded smooth curve in R4 with the following property. So let us call little m of gamma the minimum of the mass of the integral currents which bound gamma. OK, so actually, this should be big M of gamma, sorry, which is a bad notation because there's the, the mass. Um, uh, curly M of gamma. OK, and then little m of gamma is going to be the same, but I, I remove the integer multiplicity. So I allow you to actually to take a real comal, so real coefficients. So now we have two theorems which tell us that both of them are well defined. And the Lavrentiev gap phenomenon is now simple to state. This little m gamma is strictly less than this big M gamma. So that is a crazy construction with half surfaces, which is going to give you less than the minimizer when you are constrained to use only uh, um, integral coefficients. Okay? And R4 is very important. Actually, in, in Brian White's construction, this gamma is a special curve in a Klein bottle which is put in a strange way in R4. OK. So this for sure tells you that if you were hoping to get a smooth surface as a minimizer and you pick up this formulation in which you are getting real coefficients, there's no hope. The minimum exists, but must be something weird in which the coefficients, the best you can hope is that it's a combination of nice surfaces, but the coefficients are going to be uh, maybe, I don't know, half integers or, or fractions of integers, actually. OK, so very good. Sorry to, uh, to bother the experts with this uh, very long introduction. So now we finally come to uh, the main point. So we have a minimizer. And the question is, how regular this minimizer is? So is it, for instance, or can we hope that it is a classical surface? Or is it going to have necessarily some singularities? OK, so first of all, let us set some terminology, because we are going to use it uh, very often in the future. OK, so what is for me a regular point? So T now is a current. I want to define two 
uh, two objects. So the set of interior regular points of T. So these are points which are not belonging to the support of the boundary. And with the property that there is one neighborhood in which the current can be represented, the action of the current can be represented as a, an integral multiple of a classical smooth embedded surface. Okay. So there exists a ball, and now I need to introduce one notation which is the following. So it's the restriction of the current to ball of radius rho centered at x. So I will tell you in a minute more generally what I mean by restricting the current to something, to some set, which might be actually a Borel set. In this case, actually, this is an open set. So what I mean by doing this is just, for instance, take forms which are compactly supported in B rho x. And that gives you uh, a, a current. Okay? On the other hand, we actually want this current to be still living in Rn. So I'm going to give you a, a more precise definition in a second. So this should be equal to some multiple, which is integer, times the action of some sigma, where sigma is an embedded sum manifold. OK, and then, of course, the singular set of T, it's the interior singular set. What it is is just the complement of the regular points. But the, co the complement inside, uh, uh, um, I mean, in Rn, m plus n minus the, uh, uh, the support of the boundary of T. OK. Very good. So of course, now the question is, is actually the, the regular part of T, is the singularity, I mean, empty? And if we cannot hope that the singularity, uh, I mean, if the singular set empty, and in case the singular set is not empty, can we actually say that it's at least small, sufficiently small? OK, so it's not a uh, crime novel. So I'm going to give you the answer right away, instead of keeping you uh, on the dark side for the whole lecture. And the answer makes a dramatic difference for the co-dimension of the current. Of course, the co-dimension of the current is just the dimension of the ambient space minus the dimension of the current. I didn't say it, but OK. So there are two theorems. So now, um, therefore, now let us fix t, integral rectifiable, and area minimizing. The dimension of t is m. And the co-dimension is n, which means t is a current in Rn plus n. And now, very important, area minimizing. I don't want to discuss it in the future. There's a very nice and elegant way to put it. Area minimizing means that any time that I look at the mass of a current which has the same boundary, this has mass which is bigger or equal than the current that I had before. But actually, this is very easy to express now here in our case, because one effect of the isoperimetric inequality is that if the, I mean, if, if, the, if the boundary of a current in Rn plus n is equal to 0, then actually it bounds something. So all cycles are actually boundary, right? Because the homology of, Rn of, of, of the Euclidean space is trivial. OK, so this is the condition of being area minimizing. OK, so then there are two theorems. So 
So the first theorem is in code dimension 1. And let me just give you the names correctly. So first, when the dimension of the cardinal is less or equal than 6, so until you are in a seven-dimensional Euclidean space, the singularity is empty. And this you could credit to the Georgie and Fleming for m equal to Almgren for m equal 3 and Simons for 4 up to 6. Actually, this is, OK, so I'm, I'm going to be a bit more precise because I'm going to give you an history of the regularity theory. This is a bit, it's not like the guy solved it for m equal 2, then Armgren's come with a different proof. I mean, all is constructed and piled up on top of the work of the others. I mean, it's really kind of an achievement of everybody. Simons put, I mean, Simons solves an important problem, but he solves an important problem inside the theory, which then gives you the regularity, OK, which we are going to explain anyhow. OK, then. 4m equal 7, the singular set is discrete. So it's made of, of isolated points. For m bigger than 7, the singular set has Ausdorf dimension. At most, m minus 7, and it's again Federer. And then plus Simon, it is rectifiable. Sorry? Uh, the singular, I mean, this singular set has not only dimension m minus 7, but is m minus 7 countably rectifiable. OK, and on top of this, maybe let me write it over here. 5, Bombieri, De Giorgi Giusti. This is optimal. OK, but this is not what is going to be the main focus of our uh, uh, course, although I will actually start from this because it's a prerequisite to go to the higher co-dimension. And now here, this is not the collective effort of uh, several mathematicians, but it's essentially uh, uh, the uh, uh, masterpiece of one single mathematician. OK, so there is first a silly think. I don't know uh, to whom I should credit this. OK, so uh, for m equal 1, the singular set is empty. You can do it by exercise. And then here, it's actually Algren. So for m larger than 1, the dimension of the singular set is at most m minus 2, the Hausdorff dimension. And this has been improved by Chang for m equal 2, the singular set of t is discrete. OK, so it's a good place to stop, I think. We can make a 10 minutes break, so I can start again at uh, 4.30. So let me tell you, so what do we want to do? So we want to actually analyze mostly uh, this proof. 
Um, so this was known as big Almgren's regularity paper because it uh, it was a huge proof before it was um, before the joy of tech. I think it was uh, more than 1,700 pages, and uh, we have a more modern version of this theorem. So we are essentially following the same program of Almgren, broadly speaking, but of course we have added some new ideas to make it shorter and more accessible. And I also think, although this is going to be very difficult to, to I mean, if you pinpoint down, I mean, if you ask me uh, uh, where, uh, it's going to be difficult to answer to this. I think it's also more powerful, meaning that we can hope to do some more stuff, because I think we have understood some pieces better. But of course, if you really ask me, what can you do that he cannot do? It starts being tough, because if I have to you know, uh, go to page 700 and really see whether my statement is not included, um, it's not something that I've done somehow. So it's uh, more like my feeling. OK, so the plan is actually to uh, look at this. But it will be impossible to look at this without uh, making first a little bit of history on what happened over here. Okay? And this is what we start doing uh, in the next hour. Okay, so before I go on examining the regularity in co dimension one, let me just give you a couple of um, uh, technical remarks. Okay, so first of all, let me introduce you to the density. So, what is the density of a current? So, when it exists, it's the four. Uh, okay, no, before I should actually localize the mass. Sorry. Okay, so first of all, I have to introduce the total variation. OK, so if I have a current T, one thing which I can define is the following object on open sets. So this is going to be the supremum of T of omega, where I ask that the co-mass of omega is less or equal than 1, and omega is supported in big omega. OK, so what does this mean, essentially, if I had been looking at a classical surface I'm actually intersecting the classical surface with the open set omega, and then I'm looking at the mass of this intersection. So it turns out it's actually a rather easy exercise that if the current has finite mass or locally finite mass, actually this thing over here, which is called total variation, is a Radon measure. Okay? OK, so once I have something like this, I can define the density for an m-dimensional current by looking at the ratio between the total variation on a ball of reduced rho and the corresponding volume for a classical m-dimensional disk, with, with I wouldn't, which I would denote by omega m r to the m. OK, so that's the density. And So if it exists, the density is the limit as the radius goes to 0 of the total variation on the ball of radius rho, centered at x, re-divided by omega m rho to the power m. OK, so this omega m is always going to be the uh, m-dimensional uh, Lebesgue measure of the unit ball in Rm. OK, so now what happens? I mean, the only things which is interesting for us in the moment, I mean, there is always going to be integral rectifiable currents. So what happens for integral rectifiable currents? It happens the following very nice fact. Theta exists almost everywhere with respect to the total variation. And it's an integer almost everywhere. So that's if you want a theorem. More than a theorem is maybe a proposition. So if T is integral rectifiable, Theta exists and belongs to the real number, to, 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 to the natural numbers, T almost everywhere. 
actually, if you go back to the representation that I give you for that I gave you for integral rectifiable currents, right, with uh, multiples of pieces of submanifolds, the integral over there is going to be exactly the coefficient which we put in front of the compact sets ki, almost everywhere. Okay, so it's consistent with the chopping uh, with, with chopping into pieces that I did before. OK, so that's one, one thing which is going to be very important. A, thing, a second thing which is going to be very important for us is the following procedure, which we, we, which we will call blow up. OK, so if I have a form, I can pull back the form. And since currents are defined in duality with respect to forms, I can push forwards current. OK, so if f is a smooth map and it's proper I can push forward the current I have to define the action on form omega and one and the way to do this is to pull back the form and then compute t on this okay so so so, so. as he was saying this is just fancifying a very natural operation <laughs> so if sigma is a nice surface and f is a diffeomorphism, pushing forward would mean just to take f of sigma, so the image of sigma through the diffeomorphism. And uh, this would be completely compatible. So if t is just the current induced by a nice guy, f sharp t would be just this one, at least if f is a diffeomorphism. In all the cases in which we will be interested, essentially f will be a diffeomorphism in almost all the cases. OK, what about this proper? OK, so this proper is just, I mean, if the map is not proper, you see if I pull back a differential form uh, via a map which is not proper, the, 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 the corresponding differential form might not have compact support, OK? This is just slightly technical, because on the other hand, if the support of the current t is uh, compact, then I don't care. I can integrate even forms which have non-compact support. So let's put it between parentheses. OK, so now there is a very natural operation that I can do on, on, on surfaces, and which, I'm, and which we do all the time. And it's just dilations by, by a constant factor. OK? So I, I, I can take as map f what I will uh, denote by i p r. So what is this map? So this map takes a point p, puts it back in the origin, and the largest the surface by a factor 1 over r. So in particular, uh, what is happening is that if I look at the ball of radius r centered at p, this will be mapped into a ball of radius 1 centered at 0. And my surface will be correspondingly dilated. Okay? So this is just a procedure to zoom into a small portion if you're taking r small. If you're taking r big, then you're blowing down from infinity. OK, so one interesting point for uh, uh, integral rectifiable currents, so this is another proposition, which is not too hard to prove, but it's also not that easy. So if, if I take an integral rectifiable current and I do this procedure, for almost all points, what I will recover in the limit is a plane with a given multiplicity. Okay? So if you have a smooth surface and you do this procedure at a certain point p, right, and you let the, the, the dilating factor go to infinity, that is the little r go to 0, your surface will look more and more like the tangent space to the surface. Okay? If I do this on an integral rectifiable current, I'm not guaranteed that this is going to happen everywhere, but it will happen at least almost everywhere. Okay? So that's the proposition. So for t almost every p, of course here t is integral rectifiable. Uh, this procedure, so if I take the current tpr, which is going to be the push forward of the current t via my dilation, so this guy is converging to an integral multiple, which is going to be exactly the, 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 the theta there at the point p, 
times a plane pi. Now, what do I mean by this notation? By this notation, of course, I mean that the plane pi is going to be considered an oriented submanifold. So pi has an orientation. Okay? So of course, this would kind of encourage you to define such a pi as the tangent space at that point to the current t. So pi is usually called the approximate tangent. Because of course, if you had a smooth surface, you would converge uniformly, or CK. Here, you're converging in a weak sense, in the sense of current. And now it comes an, inter an interesting point. Once you have these two objects, once you have the theta and the pi, you can actually represent your integral rectifiable current in a way which is similar to manifolds, which I think you were exposed to last week. So what you could do is the following. So you pick your tangent plane pi and choose a base, an orthonormal base, which is positively oriented for pi. And then construct the corresponding m vector. OK, this guy, of course, now will depend on the point p, right? So this one is usually, I mean, the usual notation for it is this one. And now it happens that I can represent my integral rectifiable current as a measure in the following way. So I could, I could use the following identity that t is equal to theta, my t vector, and then my total variation. In the following sense, when I look at the action of t on a form, I can recover it by an integral over this Borel measure. So I have the form at the point P, and I can make the duality pairing with my m vector t at the point P. Then I multiply by the uh, density. And then I integrate over this total variation, which I told you it's a Borel measure. Now, this is just, I mean, Explained in this way, it's just a fancy formulation of the radon nicodym theorem, actually. OK, so this is an effort of the radon nicodym theorem. So you can think about a current as a measure taking values in, in, in a certain vector space. And that, that would be the radon nicodym decomposition of it. OK, so if you know what, what that is, I'm happy. If, if you don't know, I'm happy either way, because I just gave you the formula. But this is a fancy corollary or radon nicotine. Now I always get it wrong. Where, where is the i and where is the y? This way, right? And then there's an accent. Like here? Well, I don't know. Well, my Hungarian friend is not here to reproach me anyhow, so. Very good. So now, once I have this, you see that what I can do is I can define a restriction of the current t to any Borel set. So this will be a definition. If you give me a Borel set, the restriction of the current t to this set is going to be defined as I'm integrating this quantity, but the integral is taken over only over this set. OK? So in particular, if I have a surface, of course, this would mean just I take a surface, I intersect it with the set, and then I integrate over this intersection. And for a general integral rectifiable current, this is what I've just defined. OK, so this should be all for the technical part. Now we can start by investigating the uh, regularity problems. 
So what is the first information that uh, you can gain on, uh, on an area minimizing quadrant? So, well, the first thing that I think every book does is the so-called monotonicity formula, which is the effect of a very simple idea in our context and in our framework, which is that of area minimizers. So if I want to gain some information on the behavior of the current somewhere, what I can do is I can cook up some competitors for it. Yes? Oh, right, right. Sorry. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Right, sorry, sorry. So this was very bad. This was very bad, sorry. So my mistake, actually. So, OK. So you can do it this way. So this would be the radon nicotine, in fact. But there's an extra step that you can take. And the extra step is that here you have the Hausdorff measure on the union of the sets ki, which we're defining uh, before. OK, so this we could call r, and r is a rectifiable set. Right. And then therefore you have two formulas. So one formula would be this one. And the other formula would be in which I have the density. I'm integrating with the Austoff measure. And then I have to integrate over the set R, which is the rectifiable set, which comes from taking the unions of the C1 pieces, okay, which were in the definition. OK, so now I understand why several people were looking at the formula in a suspicious way. Sorry? Right, OK, so now for the restriction, you have two different formulas. Either you take uh, uh, this one, or of course, you take the second and you integrate over R intersected with E. Of course, that was only just to see if you, if you were following, right? <laughs> OK, monotonicity formula. So mm, what you can do is the following. So assume your surface. So assume a priori that your current is a nice uh, surface, OK? Monotonicity. So here's the heuristic. So assume your current is a nice surface. So T area minimizing and OK, so here you have your surface. And now you can chop a piece of the surface, which comes into a ball, and replace it by the cone, which has as basis the intersection of the surface with the sphere, and as vertex, the central point. OK, so of course, now this is a surface which has the same boundary as before. And of course, it must have larger area. OK? Now, you can do this for a general current. So you can take a general current, intersect it with a sphere. We will see maybe next time uh, uh, that is called usually slice, slicing. And then you can build the cone over it. OK, so how do you build a cone over a current? So there is a general definition using homotopy formulae. 
But another way for integratifiable currents that you might think about is the following. So integratifiable currents are, for all purposes, just pieces of, I mean, they're kind of Frankenstein C1 surfaces. So they're pieces of C1 surfaces patched in a strange way, possibly. But as long as all the, th all the calculus that you're doing only involves the tangent space, you can always think about them as C1 surfaces. So for defining a cone, what you could do is you take it, you uh, undo the patching, so you, 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 you unpatch the Frankenstein, you make the cone for each piece, and then you put it back all together. Okay? So that's one way of defining it. Now, a cone, for us in the future, it's going to be, uh, uh, we're going to use the following notation. So uh, let's put it this way. So this is the cone with vertex P and boundary S. OK? So what actually are you doing over here? So what you're doing over here, you're actually doing the following operation. So you're taking your current T. You are subtracting the part of the current which lives inside the ball. Then what you are doing, you are taking the boundary of this, right? The boundary of this is going to be this slice with the sphere. And you are making a cone with the central point x. OK, so in, in the theory of currents, this would be uh, the symbol for all of this. And I gave you also the definition of one-dimensional slices. So when I'm slicing over uh, hypersurfaces which bound nice sets, actually the slice can be defined in the following way. I take the current, I restrict it to the set. Of course, when I restrict it to the set, I have created some extra boundary. And the boundary is leaving, I mean, when it is a nice surface, it's just leaving on the boundary of the open set. And that's the slice. OK, so this must have more mass, right? Because the, the guy is a minimizer. And this means simply that what I have removed must have less mass than the cone. OK? So this is the inequality which I can write down. OK, so now if I had a nice, smooth surface, I would know how to compute the volume of the cone, which has that base, right? So the volume of the cone would be r divided by the dimension times the total mass of the slice. Let's check if I am correct. I think so, but I said I'm, I was going to look at this. I, I never looked at it, I think, so far. So maybe this is a good moment. Uh, yes. OK. OK, now there is something which one should prove. This is the Coaria formula. And the Coaria formula tells you what you would expect. That is, that if I slice the current, the mass of the slice is less or equal than the derivative of the mass of the current inside the ball of radius r. So this quantity over here is less or equal, it's less or equal than this. Right? I mean, I differentiate and evaluate the differential at the point rho. And now you see the beauty of this, of course, is that I have a differential inequality on this function. And if you, I mean, if you uh, do, I mean, if you, if you divide by the correct factor, what actually happens is that this is equivalent to this. Okay. 
So this ratio is monotone. So this is one way of, 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 of stating the monotonicity, the monotonicity formula. But there's actually a much nicer way which tells you not only that the, that the quantity is monotone, it tells you how big is the rest. So it gives you a formula for this, for this derivative over here, which is explicit. Okay? And this is a much stronger information. But the information with the rest, of course, comes from a more refined computation, which is not just this crude uh, uh, inequality and comparison with the, with the cone. It comes from, fr from a first variation argument. So one thing, of course, that you, that you, that you, that you should uh, keep in mind is the following. So as usual, I can make first and second variations of uh, my current by uh, uh, pushing forward the current uh, uh, along uh, um, uh, diffeomorphisms which are generated by uh, vector fields. So x vector field. By this, I then generate the usual one parameter family of diffeomorphisms. And then I can push forward my currents using, using phi t. And then, of course, I can define n variations by taking the time derivative at time 0 of this quantity. And this will depend only on my vector field x. Not true, uh, if it is minimizing. OK, so OK, so let me just put it over here, sorry. So that what I was going to write is actually notoriously incorrect. OK, so the first variation depends only on x, that's for sure. So this, the first variation of the current, of course, is just the following quantity. But probably the way I'm formulating also the k variations I can do. And now, of course, if the current is area minimizing, the first variation has to be equal to 0. It's the usual Lagrange equation. as long as my vector field doesn't touch the support of the boundary. Not only that, of course, the second variation has to be bigger or equal than 0. So now, this is usually called stationary, and this is called stable. Okay? And of course, you can think about being stationary and stable as a sort of local minimality condition. Now, the important point is that if instead of making this crude estimate, I had used the, stability, the, the stationarity, plugging in a vector field x, which is radial, then I actually could have done, after some manipulation, a much better theorem. which gives you a precise formula for that derivative. So, and this is true if the current is just stationary. In fact, it's true for a stationary variable. Okay. So if dt is equal to 0, then I'm just going to, to use the integrated form of the
There's a typo. <laughs> so the only time I'm using the notes is actually when the formula is not correct. OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the formula. So that uh, you okay. So what is this? So uh, you are integrating over y at each point y. Uh, uh, um, okay, sorry. So here's the, the current. So at each point y, you have a tangent. At almost each point y, you have a tangent plane to the current, and that is the orthogonal part to that tangent plane of the vector y minus x. So you take y minus x to the point. You then subtract the projection on the tangent plane that, you re that you're seeing at the point y. If there is a tangent plane. If there's not a tangent plane, don't bother because, of course, you are integrating over this, and the points where there are no tangent planes is a null set. OK, and this integral rectifier. And of course, this has to be true as long as the balls are not touching the support of the, of the boundary. So 0, less than s, less than r, less than the distance between the point x and the boundary and the support of the boundary of t. OK. So now, as I was telling you before, this gives you one very important corollary. The first very important corollary is that the density ex exists at every point for an area minimizing current. So that limit is always good. It always exists, which is a very useful piece of information. But it's not the only useful piece of information. There is another one. And now I'm experiencing the drawback. I would like to use this later, and it's going to be covered. OK? Ah, that's, that's how that happened, I guess, right? <laughs> I'm not the first one <laughs> to make the mistake. <laughs> OK, so one nice thing that one would like to use is the following. So when I'm doing the zooming, maybe I can pull it up again. Then I'm not going to use it an anymore. So when I have this rest, right? So the formula is telling you something very interesting. If this quantity is constant, uh, sorry, if this quantity is 0, which means if this ratio is constant, OK, then this integral has to vanish. This integral vanishes means that y minus x has to be tangent to the surface. But y minus x is tangent to the surface if and only if the surface is a cone with vertex x. Okay? So this formula is telling you not only that area minimizing currents have the monotonicity, so that this one is bigger or equal than that one, but it's also telling you that if you are at the case of equality, so if you are in the, in the, in the, um, in the case in which the ratio is constant, this enforces this guy to be a cone. Okay? So of course now what you would like to do is the following. You would like to say, okay, so let us take now our sequence of the scalings which we did, which we took before. Okay? So take a subsequence of that which is converging to a current which comes from the compactness theorem. Hopefully that is area minimizing. Okay, so that's actually a, a theorem which I'm going to state in a second. If that is area minimizing and if the limit of the mass, I mean if the masses are going to the limit, then for that final object, this ratio is going to be constant when I use balls which are centered in 0. Which means actually that my final object, although I don't know whether it is a plane or not, if I am in a regular point, that would be a plane, I still know that it is a tangent cone, that it is an area minimizing cone. So it has lost one dimension in its complexity, right? So because it's described essentially by the cross section. And that's a big deal. OK, so let me state this proposition over here. The monotonicity formula also has another interesting corollary, which I'm going to tell you in a second. So first of all, there is the following theorem for which I give you a uh, uh, um, um, loose explanation. So if 
OK, so if the mass of TK plus the mass of the boundary is uniformly bounded, TK is converging to some T. TK is area minimizing. Well, let's assume the boundary of TK is equal to 0 inside some, some open set omega. OK, then t restricted to omega is also area minimizing. OK, proof with quotation marks. So what is actually happening is something like this. So your sequence of currents is converging to this final current over here. So it looks like this. This one is going down. Well, it looks like this if the convergence is nice, which is most likely not going to be for the moment. But it looks like this. So now say that you have a current which is making less area for the orange one. So you have a competitor which makes less area. Now what you would like to do is you would like to use this competitor right, to contradict the minimality of the sequence which is getting close to it. Of course, it's not, I mean, the, the currents are converging to the other current, but it's not quite that this, that they are equal, right? So you have to lose a certain amount of energy in the patching. So what you would like to do is something like this, right? So some kind of patching over here. And then use this as a competitor. And what is going to happen is that the green current is gaining a certain amount, delta, whereas the patching is going to be less and less costly in the energy as the sequence is approaching down the final current. OK, so that would be a proof. Now, of course, there's the deformation lemma, which tells you that you can do the patching. So this is a pretty complicated fact. OK, so deformation lemma, which I quoted before, is the technical tool to make the patching. Now, notice another thing. So not only this guy is telling you, not only this proof is telling you that you cannot lower the, energy, the mass of the final current, right? It's also telling you that the semi-continuity of the mass that you had for free must actually be continuity in this case. I mean, if the final current is going to be strictly less than the limit of the masses of the other currents, then you can use that guy as a competitor, OK? So it also tells you that there is a stronger sort of convergence in this, in this thing over here. OK, the stronger sort of convergence is that this total variation mass is converging weakly star in the sense of measure to this guy inside omega. There's a little technical problem. So there might be loss of mass, but only towards the boundary. So as soon as you are inside omega, there cannot be any loss of mass. OK, so now this theorem combined with the monotonicity formula has a corollary. And the corollary is the following. So any time that you make the blow up procedure that we introduced before, so T area minimizing. And notice that you use the, 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 I mean, you need the area minimizing for the compactness argument. Huh? That's important. But otherwise, the monotonicity formula is true for stationary. So T area minimizing for every x, you can take the rescaled current, which we have called Txr, and up to subsequences, they are converging to cones. So area minimizing cones, which are called Tangent cones.
not anymore tangent planes, because you don't know it's a plane, but tangent cones. And beware, because it's probably, no, it is. It is the most, it's the most challenging problem in the field. You don't know that this cone is unique. Nobody told you. You have to take a subsequence. And it's a very widely open, open problem to, I mean, I think people expect it's unique. It's a very wide open problem to show that this is unique. It has been solved in some very meaningful situations, but which, which are very far to cover uh, uh, all the possibilities. So of course, you know one situation in which the tangent cone is unique. If you have regularity, then it's going to be the tangent plane, right? So if you want this uniqueness of tangent cones is a kind of pre regularity question. I mean, even before you know regularity, you are wondering whether you have a unique object in the limit. OK, so now let me propose, therefore, the following naive approach to regularity. So of course, if, so if you are at a regular point, at that point, there is a unique tangent cone, which is the tangent plane to your surface counted with the multiplicity that is given you in, 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 in a certain uh, neighborhood. So the regular set of T is contained in the sets of point X at which there exists at least one flat tangent cone. OK, so for me now, flat tangent cone means a plane counted with multiplicity. Let me write it over here. You might wonder whether the other inclusion is also correct. That would be a naive conjecture. And it actually turns out to be false. But what turns out to be true is that in co-dimension 1, this is really equal. So in co-dimension 1, as soon as one tangent cone is flat, you're actually able to prove regularity. In co-dimension higher than 1, that is actually false, which is the reason why the two theorems look so different and why the proofs are Rather, I mean, why the proof of the theorem in higher codimension is much more complicated. OK. So let me make the following remark. So in codimension 1, equality. In higher codimension, strict inclusion. And this is, in a nutshell, the whole difference between the two situations. And we are going to see why. OK, so actually, the remark is not a remark, but it's a fundamental theorem. Let me actually just state what is the situation in all dimension and co-dimensions. Then I stop, and we start tomorrow by analyzing how uh, the co-dimension, I mean, how, how the proof of the co-dimension one case works, and uh, then why in higher co-dimension actually this doesn't work. OK, so let me here, right, so let me here introduce what is the first so in, in a sense, the monotonicity, the, the monotonicity formula is step zero of the regularity theory. Let me introduce you to step one, OK? So which was pioneered by uh, De Giorgi for sets of finite, of finite perimeters. So we are going to see uh, why. 
Okay, in order to state uh, the main theorem, I actually need you, uh, I need actually to define a certain quantity, which is very important, and it's called the excess. Okay, so now you take T, which is an integer rectifiable m dimensional current. and pi in m dimensional plane now we are going to to take pi with a vector on top of it with with, with an arrow so that is going to be the m dimension i mean this is going to be the m unit i mean the unit m vector which orients pi right because it's an orientable uh, plane OK, so what is the excess of the current T in the ball <coughs> B with respect to the plane pi? That's the following quantity. So I first normalize by omega m r uh, rho to the power m. So this is just uh, a normalization factor. And then I'm going to take the integral over the ball of radius rho centered at p. And I take the difference between the m vector orienting my current and the plane pi. OK? So to the, to the power 2. So you, you can think about it as an L2 oscillation, essentially, of the tangent planes, right? Well, not really an L2 oscillation, because I'm, 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 I'm taking a, a, a fixed point pi. But what I can define is I can define the excess without any reference to a plane by simply minimizing that quantity over all possible planes. Uh, no, it's T, right? Okay, so this, this will be uh, the most important parameter for uh, our epsilon regularity theorem, which is coming in a second. So what I'm going to state is a prototype of an epsilon regularity theorem, meaning I will just claim the following. When this guy is below a certain threshold, there's a threshold, which is a uni I mean, it's the universal constant, which will depend only on dimension and co-dimension. And when the oscillation is smaller than this threshold, in half the ball, I will be a classical surface. That's the epsilon regularity theorem. And that would be wonderful if it were really this way. But it doesn't come this way. It comes with two technical addition, I mean, with a couple of, of, of additional requirements. And a couple of them are totally innocent, but one of them is a pain in the ass. OK, so here's the theorem. And so an initial version of this theorem was proved in co-dimension 1 by the Georgi. In higher co-dimension, I think the first one to prove it is actually Andren. OK, so. There exists two guys, so a universal constant C and a universal constant epsilon, bigger than 0. They depend only on dimension and co-dimension, such that. So if so, first requirement. Innocent. So T is area minimizing. Integer rectifiable and blah, blah. And the boundary of T is equal to 0 on the ball of radius 2 rho, centered at some point P. So that's innocent. 
B. This is not so innocent. So the density at the point P is equal to Q and the density at any other point x is equal to q for t almost every x. I think we are on the ball of radius 2, though. And this is the problematic thing. Because the monotonicity formula actually tells you one corollary, which I forgot to tell you. No, it's coming. The monotonicity formula tells you not only that theta exists at every point, but it tells you that it's upper semi-continuous. So the natural condition over here would be something like less or equal than q almost everywhere, right? Because after all, it's upper semi-continuous. And since it has to be integer valued almost everywhere, it cannot pick up the value q plus 1 for a sequence of points which is going to the central point. But the upper semi-continuity does not exclude that there is a point of density 2 and there are points of density 1 which are converging to it. And of course, for our definition of regularity, that is not going to be a regular point. Okay? And I'm asking a priori that that doesn't happen, which is a bad sign, right? Because I'm asking a priori that that point is not a singular point of a certain kind. And that's the reason why this condition is bad. Of course, the, the, the one above is harmless. OK, then it comes with another condition. But this is, OK, so this I've put in condition B, but actually this is armless as well. So let me, let me separate it. So now the monotonicity formula tells me that the ratio of this divided by rho to the m is converging from above to the density of the point, to q. So this is completely armless. Of course, the monotonicity formula tells me at a certain point I will be below this threshold, right? Because the density is the limit. OK, and then there is the final requirement, right? Oh, right, yes, absolutely. Uh, otherwise, it's silly. Yes, 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 yes. Thanks. Somebody's still following. Good, uh, absolutely, of course, it's the ratio which has to converge to this guy. Otherwise, it's a silly condition. OK, and finally, I want the excess to be sufficiently small. With respect to some plane pi, OK? And, and, and it's coming for a reason why. OK, this is also kind of armless. As soon as you have a tangent plane which is flat. Uh, why? Because, OK, so in principle, I know I'm converging to the tangent plane in mass, right? If I'm making too many oscillations, if I'm converging to a flat plane, but I'm making too many oscillations, the mass of the current is not converging to the mass of the final guy. And I will contradict that theorem over there, OK? So this one is armless. As soon as I know a flat tangent cone, I know I am here. I know I am here. I know this, but that one I don't know. And this is the bad condition. I'm sorry, what is that you said? The first is something like comma. So the density at the central point is equal to q. And the density at surrounding points is equal to q almost everywhere. I mean, of course, usually people write is less or equal than q plus epsilon. Uh, but then the fact that you are integer valued will imply this condition. OK? And it's really this condition which is used. I mean, if I have a point of, um, I mean, if I have a point of strange multiplicity, I don't care. Are really the points of, of integer multiplicity which have to be the correct ones. OK, so these are the hypotheses. And now the theorem comes with uh, uh, the following conclusion. OK, so then. In B rho x, 
the support of the current is the graph of a C1 alpha function. from pi to the orthogonal to pi. So not only a C1 alpha function, but a C1 alpha function with this reference. And it comes with an estimate. For some reason I want to, for some reason which will become clear tomorrow. So the uh, uh, zero alpha semi-norm is controlled by a constant. Here you have the excess to the power one half. And here you just have rho to the minus alpha as a scaling factor. Sorry? Ah, the derivative, the derivative. G. Right. For the function, you have the corresponding estimate. I mean, for, for the C0 norm, you have the corresponding estimate. OK, so I'm going, uh, sorry? Uh, uh, no, no, no epsilon, no epsilon, right? Because I estimated directly in, in terms of that. Uh, I mean, of course, it will be less or equal than epsilon, but but I have a stronger I have a stronger estimate, right? It's in the e. Sorry. Right. Uh, epsilon is here. Epsilon is there. Is the smallness condition? What is C? No, C is a universal constant. So you have one over some, I mean, this condition and the excess one. The first condition has some epsilon. Right. So it disappears from the estimate. It disappears from the estimate, right. Well, it's in the estimate because since E is less than epsilon, this guy is less than epsilon to the one half. Okay? But if E were one million epsilon, uh, I mean one millionth epsilon, then I have a better estimate if I write it in, the fo in this way. Okay? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going extra time actually. I promised you to finish before. I'm not. Sorry. But let me just say one final thing. So, and that's the important point. So that is the difference between co-dimension one and higher co-dimension. In co-dimension one, the hypothesis B can be removed. And then it is a true epsilon regularity theorem. The hypothesis B will come actually from the co-dimension one assumption and some extra structure. And in higher co-dimension, the hypothesis B is really needed. There are counterexamples. OK, so very important. And this will come tomorrow in the first hour. So co-dimension one, B can be removed in the following sense. Anytime that you have a flat tangent cone at that point, that condition will be true in a neighborhood. And it comes because I can reduce via coaria formula the problem of minimizing currents to that of minimizing boundaries of sets. In higher co-dimension, B cannot be removed. That is, there are singular points which satisfy the condition A, C, and D, but not the condition B. And in particular, that tells you that there are singular points where the uh, one, I mean, where, where there are flat tangent cones. Okay, so that's it. <laughs>